Absolutely. Thank you so much. And uh, welcome, everyone, uh, to this panel. And thank you so much for making time uh, for this very timely and relevant conversation. I think we have been talking about this topic of digital transformation, multidisciplinarity. And in fact, in the morning also, we had eminent speakers discuss a little bit details on hinting on how multidisciplinary education is going to be very key, important or key pillar of the higher education going forward. Uh, so I obviously, you know, shared uh, some pointers with this panel uh, for everyone's uh, information, but uh, certainly, you know, happy to see, you know, what are the thoughts uh, the panel members, eminent panel members have uh, for on this particular topic. So before we start, obviously, you know, I will request everyone to share their thoughts on, uh, you know, what is multidisciplinarity in your perspective, because I think this is a terminology which is being used significantly in the higher education uh, sector as well as the ed tech industry. I think it's important that, you know, they hear from you firsthand. Uh, so if you can just help us understand, you know, what is multidisciplinarity in your perspective so that everyone is aware on that. And then secondly, uh, we would obviously like to uh, understand, you know, what is digital transformation? When we say digital transformation, what is your take on digital transformation? So I think one of the gap uh, which this conversation can certainly fill is a lot of companies, private organizations who want to support higher education sector, they may not understand the requirement that well. So maybe one side we can start from here. Uh, we will go through the multidisciplinarity, maybe keep a couple of minutes as a topic, uh, just in a sense, you know, what is multidisciplinarity in your perspective? And then we will start the other way around in terms of, you know, what is digital transformation? What is the need of the hour from a university system? Um, so, uh, and obviously, I know that, you know, our names are reflected here. Um, you know, please uh, call out your name, introduce, you know, which university you are from. Uh, my name is Saurabh Bajaj. I am from Sunstone. Sunstone is a higher education service provider. We work with the higher education institutions, right, from marketing, admissions, academic operations, placements, and internships as well. So, please, sir, over to you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bajaj. Uh, also, it's a privilege to be sharing the dash with uh, such eminent uh, panelists today. Uh, I come from a university called Swami Vivekananda Yoga Anusandhan Samsthana. Uh, probably gives uh, the first hint that why we need multidisciplinary approach because it has started with uh, yoga as uh, the main discipline, as the backbone, and we moved on to adding multiple other things because the whole institution is based on the teachings of Swami Vivekananda, who actually defined education as the manifestation of perfection already in you, or any individual who is seeking education. And uh, also said that uh, each soul is potentially divine, and the purpose is to manifest the divinity within. So education should actually help us in taking us from a point A to a point B, where it is not something new, but empowering you to achieve that. When we also uh, look at whether it is Swami Vivekananda who said, but this approach has been most consistent in recent times, more than 150 years, we have uh, Michael Gulp, who is a non-fictional author who uh, spoke a lot about Da Vinci Code. Uh, he also says exactly the same, that your brain has a capacity for learning that is virtually limitless and which makes every human a potentially potential genius. So when we talk of multidisciplinary approach, the whole purpose, what we look at is how can we empower an individual? One way, is it that conventional education which brings all those components needed for an individual or else along with that conventional education, which are those flexible aspects which makes an individual's passion blossom and also enjoy the process of education. So these two aspects are certainly very important for us to talk about the multidisciplinary approach. And second, uh, certainly uh, we have uh, NEP uh, giving us uh, wide scope for multidisciplinary approach. So we always say that it brings in flexible systems for better adherence. We know that somebody is pushed into doing a commerce uh, course, doing an engineering course or a medical program. So after uh, first year, the person feels that this discipline is not the choice of, an, uh, choice of myself. So now what can I do? 
So you see, in engineering, uh, many students carrying their uh, dropped out subjects up to eighth semester, okay, uh, to a number of around 15, 20 subjects. So the reason may be is that they are not uh, enjoying it on one side. Number two, that's not the choice what they uh, have been uh, looking for doing it. We have already examples set in for multidisciplinary approach, like IICs to IITs, starting uh, medical education and super specialty hospitals on one side. And uh, we have IAMs starting yoga and humanities uh, divisions, as well as programs uh, in uh, uh, making. Medical universities starting biotechnology programs too. Uh, this fact, though we think that it's new in India, was uh, well adopted in the West as uh, Around uh, 25 years when I was in Melbourne, uh, the well-known institution, RMIT, was so good, though it talks of uh, information, I mean technology, the medical uh, hospital, what they have is the state-of-the-art facility. And uh, not to mention Harvard's to MIT's to UCLA's to Imperial College. So having said that, the last part, what I would like to mention with respect to multidisciplinary approach is not just the topic or subject of study, but also various aspects, including research. So we are so bound on making it uh, too much of a theoretical uh, aspect. So importance to research is very much less here. And uh, also bringing, uh, Swami Vivekananda said one more thing, that bring the best of the East with the best of the West. So that's where we need to combine the traditional knowledge on one side and modern research on the other side. And it should result in excellent publications, patents, and of course, copyrights, etc. These are not at all the end products of academic research. Somebody doing a PG-based program or a PhD program, most of their research remain in theses or dissertations. So that's the approach what we need to adapt to make it uh, palpable one. And of course, uh, I always remember uh, two uh, twin brothers in Delhi. Uh, their names are Ishraj and Yuraj. They are school dropouts. And they have a big organization to promote entrepreneurial uh, uh, journey for students in schools. So if this can happen in schools, this same can be applied to higher education institutions. Though Technology-based institutions are a little good in this, but uh, many other di uh, disciplines lack this. So I end here, and uh, we will take this discussion forward. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, for your kind words. Uh, may I request uh, Professor Shetty to uh, comment on the same, please? Thank you. Uh, I am Dr. Balkrishna Shetty, Vice Chancellor of Sri Siddhartha University. Uh, we have a medical college and a dental college. Um, multidisciplinary programs, and another thing you spoke about, uh, digital programs, skill. These are three words making a lot of names, you know. These are the three buzzwords which is happening in each and every higher education meetings, higher education department, universities, UGC. Everybody is talking about skill, multidisciplinary, NEP, and uh, uh, digitalization. I would like to say multidisciplinary means, uh, especially in medical education, what is uh, multidisciplinary? Today, I feel multidisciplinary is uh, not only teaching and learning, but uh, working for all these uh, ranking programs. I would like to say, if, uh, if my faculty members are what they are doing, most of the time they'll be working for getting ranks in uh, NIRF, NBA, and uh, UGC inspection, MCI inspection, all this inspection. I would like to say that this multidisciplinary is not into education and learning and technologies. It has become more into getting ranks for our universities and institutions. That is a sorry state of these higher education institutions. First of all, I would like to say, multidisciplinary, what is multidisciplinary? I would like to say if multidisciplinary is something which will make my student stronger to perform when he becomes an either an engineer or a doctor. 
that is the most important multidisciplinary program which we should talk about and this particular multi when we talk about multidisciplinary programs the most important limitation or defect in these multidisciplinary programs is we do not have any student in these programs we just speak about the vice chancellors principals and managing directors we should ask the student what is multidisciplinary program for him we don't ask the student we only ask the vice chancellors and other people if a student is there then he will tell him what is multidisciplinary if there is a student is learning in my in, in my college if i ask him he'll say sir multidisciplinary means i would like to say how to talk to the patient how to interact with the patient how to have some patience to talk to the patient these are most important things and number 2 is how to establish a hospital how to establish you know like how to manage these patients that will be a much more multidisciplinary rather than just reading now of course corona has taught us a great lesson that teaching is not learning in between four concrete halls it has gone beyond the concrete halls into the homes and into various uh, levels so it is not just teaching or it is not just learning from a textbook it is something beyond so multidisciplinary aspect is i would like to say it is inclusiveness include the student for each and every program each and in each and every program we should ask the student to come to the podium and start talking about this particular aspect then i would say it is multidisciplinary so the first point in multidisciplinary is including the student in each and every program that is multi not in accreditation programs but in teaching and learning programs that is multidisciplinary so this is a two things this is the first point i will talk about multidisciplinary we will take about uh, digital program in the next no, session sir, absolutely sir uh, dr bijaragman i'll i'll probably just add a little to this now you know obviously we heard professor shetty speaking about that we are doing it for accreditation purposes probably uh, and true so you know this is obviously a fact coming out and so i would also like to understand see one of the reason i here you know in my personal capacity and i'm talking to a lot of academic leaders one of the uh, thing i come across is that sort of while we are ready to offer these courses like new electives but there are hardly one or two takers it is a significant investment for us to you know make as a uh, if we have to offer truly multidisciplinary education so if you have any experience around that obviously you start with please multidisciplinary educations you know uh, definition in your perspective and uh, would love to also see your reaction on uh, how can universities then offer these new electives multidisciplinary options uh, while ensuring that you know there is enough return on investment also because it's an investment end of the day for the university Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I bring greetings from Sri Ramchandra Institute of Higher Education Research, Chennai, and uh, I uh, really thank Dr. Shetty for bringing in a different uh, perspective of multidisciplinary. And I would also like to bring in another concept. As an institution, we started in 1985. We have grown into a major deemed university, and we do medicine, nursing, physiotherapy. dental biomedical sciences biotechnology and all these uh, uh, hospital management and you name it and then when we approached uh, the nirf and nac they said no we cannot classify you as multidisciplinary according to them i don't know who is right who is wrong but i'm raising a point of contention which uh, is worth discussing you know how the folk see the same authorities about 20 years back told that healthcare university should be separate they wanted the engineering universities to be different the medical universities to be different there are in every state there is a medical university now the medical university obviously will be developing programs of course there will be integration there will be holistic education all that will be there but because of this and i am thankful to shetty we started an engineering college so we started engineering college in 2019 and what did we do luckily we were able to apply ourselves slightly better we said we will not do an engineering college run of the mill civil engineering mechanical engineering all those things we said computer science will be our only base and in that computer science we said we will do artificial intelligence we will do cyber security we will do data analytics and we will do biomedical engineering so to that extent we are now satisfying the nirf we are satisfying the nac and we are satisfying the students need but if we have to go back to the nalandas 
and really think about holistic education as we are talking, I think this uh, terminology of multidisciplinary is very relevant. That, that uh, idea with which the government is wanting to do this through NEP is definitely appreciable because they want students to have an academic flexibility of doing almost 50% of his education outside of the court. Here, I would defer with Dr. Shetty that in medical education, unfortunately, they are all bookworms who are completely concentrating only in small areas. They have not even, now only the NMC has looked at the competency-based medical education where they are giving some electives possibility and they are allowing students almost two months of time to reach out. But where do they go? They again go from uh, general surgery to neurosurgery. They go from general surgery to cardiothoracic surgery. Now, that is the type of holistic education we are trying to provide. I am very, very happy that the points that he raised that how to get attributes like counseling, like taking an informed consent. These are very, very important and that are also part of so-called disciplinary education that we are talking about. I'll also bring in two small concepts, but ultimately what are we, if you want to get a holistic individual who is really humanistic in his support, approach, and we are aiming towards the old and 100 years old Nalandas and uh, things like that, how our whole approach has to be uh, totally in a different platform. And that I do not know whether this present NAP is really providing. And uh, as far as the question that was raised for this uh, panel, uh, what is better? I think both are important. Multidisciplinary is important. Similarly, digital transformation is equally important. So we cannot separate the two. Uh, to the organizers, I'm just telling you the titling probably needs to be looked at, but I'm happy that we are going to be all supporting both aspects of development. Thank you. No, absolutely, sir. Thank you so much. I think you are right. And maybe, you know, one of the topic I certainly want to discuss is how digital tools can be used to be more multidisciplinary, but probably the topic number three. So we are currently on the definition, um, you know, every uh, eminent panelist definition of uh, multidisciplinary education. So Professor uh, Barucha, if I pronounce that correctly, please. Uh, Sai University obviously is, you know, uh, while I think in today's world, liberal education is very much used as a synonym for multidisciplinary education. So we would like to hear your thoughts on that. Is it right? Is it, should we be looking at it slightly differently? Uh, over to you, please. Thank you. Yes, uh, I want to thank the organizers and my panelists and to say I agree with uh, my panelists. Thank you for your observations and I agree with most of the speakers that we've heard today. Um, I'm the founding vice chancellor of Sai University in Chennai that was founded to be a liberal university. Now that word liberal is misunderstood, widely misunderstood. Um, we see it in the broadest possible way as including the arts, humanities, social sciences, sciences, technology, engineering, law. And we have all of those programs, okay? There's a fundamental misunderstanding in recent years as liberal education has come to India and as NEP has, has promoted it, there's a misunderstanding that you have liberal arts and then you have engineering as if they are separate, okay? Engineers serve society and so you can't just know the technology without understanding what you're trying to achieve and the same is true of law. Okay, so we uh, attract faculty and students who are passionate about seeing the cross-pollination between these different areas. If you're talking about machine learning, the applications you're going to see coming along are going to be way beyond just technical applications. They're gonna be applications in all aspects of life. So we have to understand all aspects of life. Now, I'd like to say that uh, in terms of the approaches taken to the question of multidisciplinarity, I bring a different approach, which comes from my own professional background, which is cognitive neuroscience. And uh, I've, most of my academic career I've spent uh, in the US as a cognitive neuroscientist. And I 
a contribute in my contribution to the founding of Sai University is mostly to design it on the basis of how the mind, the brain works. For too long, and even now, we design systems of education based on our personal experience or our opinions. Education design needs to be evidence-based. Evidence of how the, the brain, which is the system in us that actually uh, acquires the education, how that actually learns, and two, evidence about the outcomes of our education system, and we have to keep innovating it. Uh, I, my apologies to the regulators and the accreditors, but um, I think that it's time for regulators and accreditors to please let us innovate. Let a thousand innovations bloom in education. Please stop telling us what to do, how to do it. I am absolutely opposed to the standardization of curriculum. One of our accreditors recently said all physics courses should be taught the same way so students can move from one university. I understand that practical requirement, but I think that's a terrible mistake. Uh, it's counter to the multidisciplinary idea. From the cognitive neuroscience point of view, if you don't mind, I'll just rattle off a few points and some other time, maybe. And all of this is based on vast amounts of empirical research in neuroscience labs, in cognitive science labs, and in uh, uh, schools of education where the research, empirical research is done. So I'll just simply summarize some of that. The Upshot is that it's time to spark the imagination of our students. Actually, kids come with a tremendous amount of imagination. Any parent knows that. Unfortunately, and I speak for myself as a guilty, uh, guilty part or part party as a parent and as an educator, we have spent too much time squashing, stifling the imagination of our children. Okay, millions of years of evolution has produced a brain that is an unbelievable learning machine. In fact, when we talk about machine learning, all those algorithms are based on how the brain works. And kids, from the time they're born, learn by exploring the environment. And that includes asking questions. Uh, before I became a parent, I vowed that uh, I would never be a parent who, when the child goes through the phase of saying, why, and then you give an answer, and they say, oh, but why? Then you, they, you give another answer, they say, oh, but why? That I would never be frustrated and say, just be quiet, do what I'm, you know, you're told to do. Because what you're doing when you simply talk down to a child or to a student is you're squashing their imagination. So it's time for our education systems to help spark and encourage our students' imaginations at all levels, preschool to university. Leave a lot of the specialized qualification to the postgraduate level. And focus the undergraduate on sparking the imagination, liberating the students' minds from the silos of disciplines of subjects. Encourage exploration, risk-taking, risk doing research with faculty, which is a kind of an exploration. Yes, uh, active learning, experiential learning, all of that. We tend to, when students come up with ideas that seem wild, we tend to put them down. We start taking them seriously. We're in Bangalore here, the innovation capital of India. Innovation is going to be the future of the economy of the country. Or, and innovation, by definition, means connecting dots that previously were not connected. That's multidisciplinarity, okay? Uh, you can't have a new product or a new service or a new company just doing something that you learned in your textbooks. Textbooks have turned out to be the most dulling uh, tool in education. I'm not saying we can do without them. I'm saying we need to complement them now 
by other kinds of things. We need to develop our innate student talent. This country is the breeding ground of talent for the world. As soon as you get off the plane in any Western country, they see India as the breeding ground of the brains of the world. Unfortunately, our students want to flee India. I've taken polls now. It's shocking. It's depressing. I returned to India after 35 years in the U.S. because I saw the NEP and I decided this is the time to innovate. Our students are far smarter than we are. Our children are far smarter than we are. We need to spend less time telling them what to learn, how to learn, when to learn, what to be, and listening to them. Listening to what their aspirations are, what their passions are, and encourage them to do the kinds of things they love to do. Okay? A B-Tech who isn't really passionate or that good with it is not going to be a, 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 an asset to the economy. It's going to be a liability. And we're seeing that playing out already. Okay? Uh, I joke with friends about the recovering engineers. Okay? We see them everywhere in HR and, <laughs> you know. Uh, let students follow their passions. Help them be the best they can be at the things that they want to do. Focus less on subject knowledge and more on fundamental cognitive skills. There are many fundamental cognitive skills. I will just summarize the research by saying there is a consensus that you can boil it down to two. One is critical thinking and one is communication. Neither of which has been part of traditional curricula handed down by accreditors or uh, regulators in Delhi. Okay? Now, critical thinking means different people to different things to different people. There's not enough time for me to expand on that. But the world is changing so fast. Very little of what you learn in school or in college in terms of subject matter knowledge is going to be valid. What is going to be valid is the ability to adapt to a rapidly changing world, which means critical thinking is essentially the ability and the con confidence to take on a problem that you have never seen, that's never been in the textbook, that was never been in any previous JE exam. Okay, that they never taught you at Kota, at the, at the coaching camps. Okay? Because that's the kind of problem that an innovative company is going to face. A client is going to come and say, I have a novel problem, solve it for me. No, it was not in my textbook. Okay, it was not in the curriculum. Uh, that, the three or four years of undergraduate is the time to experiment with that way of thinking and faculty and teachers and administrators should encourage our students to make mistakes. That's how the brain learns, by making mistakes. We shouldn't punish, we should guide, we should encourage. Time is up. So, just, just an interest of time. Thank you. Right. Um, That's it. Right, thank you so much. You know, this, this certainly reminds me of, um, you know, very popular online course, uh, Learning How to Run by Barbara Oakley. So, you know, certainly, you know, we should be focusing on uh, you know, imparting the, uh, you know, key 21st century skills as we may use that terminology, but absolutely. Thank you so much for your thoughts, uh, Professor Barucha. Uh, I'll move on to Dr. Shridhar. Shridhar, sir, please uh, help us understand what is your definition. We heard some definitions in, you know, from universities who had primarily medical or healthcare programs. What was their perspective on multidisciplinarity? Would love to understand your thoughts, please. Uh, thank you very much uh, for giving me this opportunity. I'm Dr. Shridhar. Vice Chancellor of uh, Hindustan Institute of Technology and Science, Chennai. Our institute was uh, started by our founder in 1966. We became university in 2008. Uh, it was majorly from engineering background. Now we actually offer the liberal arts courses also. Coming to multidisciplinary, I have a few uh, experiences which I just want to share. Uh, about 10 years back, everybody wanted to make it more specific as my panel members also said. Mechanical engineer, when he goes to the industry, Industry people actually wanted him to know everything about mechanical engineering and also more specific about a few things like mechanical design, mechanical thermal power engineering and so on. Now the time has come, people are asking, do you know this, do you know that, etc. 
For example, a mechanical engineer, when he goes to industry, if he doesn't know about electrical engineering, if he doesn't know how to code using computers, if he doesn't know about the mechatronic system, then he'll be called as, okay, you are uneducated in this particular. I use that word cautionly because it is called like that. And every time, upskilling becomes very, very difficult. Off the lane, actually, I have also been uh, guiding many students in research as well as also in the master degree. For example, uh, we guided a few students who developed some prosthetics, basically in the medical engineering, but it's completely, you know, designed using engineering background. But when I actually wanted to develop that, I sent my student to the medical schools. They stayed there. They, they were with the uh, orthopedicians as well as some doctors. They took some input. Based on that, actually, they made the prosthetics leg as well as, you know, many other parts, including implant of the tooth. That also is designed. But again, this fellow need to know something about medical. Now, coming to our university, we have entered into NEP, uh, New Education Policy. And uh, we have made sure that, you know, multidisciplinary actually percolates into the system itself because we find it is more advantageous. The first question is, see, for example, recently one of my mechatronic student, he designed a robo and that robo can actually play three musical instruments provided you give a note in the beginning. So that is, he is basically a musician to start with. So now he has got the, uh, you know, knowledge of uh, building robots. Now this has become useful for him. And he has won many awards at national level also for designing such things. Similarly, we have one more uh, visual communication student and uh, visual communication is basically full of imagination and full of innovation. That person is coming out with a very fantastic engineering uh, solution to design a studio which will actually, you know, take care of all the requirements of visual communication. This is possible only when we have, uh, you know, multidisciplinary education. Lastly, I would like to also say few of our students join our institution uh, because actually we are known as a premier institution in giving education in aerospace and aero uh, aeronautical technology, many of them want to become pilots. Now we come to the simulators. We have a simulator which is actually the finest simulator we have and nowadays I also would like to, uh, you know, mention most of the medical, uh, you know, the operations or surgeries are happening with a visual aid. Suppose an engineer doesn't know anything about medical or, you know, the aspects of it, how we can design it. And similarly, see, for example, we have seen in some of the Hollywood, Bollywood movies, uh, whenever the patient is on the ICU and they'll be showing some curve and finally it's a like tick, 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 tick and then it becomes normal and everybody jumps into the patient, etc. But there are systems now, actually, it actually, you know, uh, uh, d d through data analytics, it will find out when this patient will have a critical condition. It will warn the doctors, it will warn the, uh, uh, you know, the nurses and the entire uh, staff and that is designed by an engineer with knowledge in medical. So I would say that digital, I'm uh, sorry, this... Uh, Multidisciplinary education is a must. Coming to the, some of the students of ours, they are actually, uh, you know, they are uh, very good cadets in NCC. They want to become, you know, serve our armed forces. What we have done, we have given about two credits as an elective for NCC. Now, these students spend some time in the field. They come back here, it becomes multidisciplinary. And because, as Sir said, we also have the liberal school of arts actually with us. And uh, we have many clubs, like uh, music club is there, dance club, dramatics club, etc. Now we have given the credits for all this. If the students want to spend some time, they can go and spend time and come back. Lastly, I would like to mention one more thing. I think all of us know that uh, uh, Sir Isaac Newton was a very good musician. Right. And uh, similarly, uh, many of the scientists actually, if you take, uh, take up, their cognitive skills are much higher because both sides of the brains, the left side and right side of the brain were combining together. If I take an architect, architect cannot be just a civil engineer. He has to be innovative. So with that, I would say that, uh, you know, the modern education is a boon for us. But of course, I go with all the panel members. It has to be mixed with a particular ratio. And also, it need not be common for everyone. See, for example, one uh, uh, parent asked me when I was giving this presentation, sir, I want my son to be only computer science engineer. Why you want to make him a dancer? Why you want to make him uh, to learn the music? Yeah, that is their choice. There is nothing wrong in it. If they want to do that, let them do it. So an opportunity should be given for the students, as also my panel member mentioned. It should be actually student-oriented and individualistic, rather than putting a same pill for everyone to cure a particular illness. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much, Professor. Uh, man, man, uh, sorry, I missed your name. Shridhar, Professor Shridhar. Uh, Professor Shetty, if I can come back quickly to that, because you know Professor Shridhar uh, raised a very interesting point. Now, I know that we, know we, we are talking about multidisciplinarity, but at the same place, uh, 
what as a layman it sounded to me was we are also getting into interdisciplinary because that's what you know IISRs have been set up for you know as per as a layman if I understand. So when you say that a medical student working on oh, sorry an uh, engineering student working on you know medical uh, concepts and then applying them. So would that be interdisciplinary? Would that be multidisciplinary? So you know how do we differentiate that? You know if, if you can help us understand a little better on that. Uh, Professor Shetty over to you please. It is called interdisciplinary actually. See multidisciplinary I, I would like to say it is more of interdisciplinary because medical uh, students would like to learn so many things about the technical aspects of medical, uh, medical education. So this is interdisciplinary. To start with basically like I would like to say we had universities like let's say Madras University, Bangalore University was a multidisciplinary universities only. They had technical colleges, they had engineering colleges, they had uh, agricultural college, they had medical college, everything was multidisciplinary. And suddenly we said okay it it should not be multidisciplinary, it should be unidisciplinary. Then we had health universities, uh, we had agriculture universities, we had technology. Again, you are telling it should be multidisciplinary. See, these are the Now, what I would li like to ask everybody, what the student has benefited out of these things? We are just changing everything. We don't know how much a student has benefited out of this, changing the concepts of the universities. It is what is important for your son, my son, and everybody's children here, how much he can learn, how, what good student he can be become, what he can perform in the society, that is much more important than what sort of universities we have. That is the most important thing I would like to say. So it is not interdisciplinary, it is not multidisciplinary, it is inclusiveness, number one, it is empowerment of the student. I would like to tell you a simple thing, like if you conduct a universal program for a student, like a global competition, let's say Math B, who will be the best student? The top student will be the Indian student. If you conduct a spelling bee, the top student will be the Indian student. If you go to NASA, you see the top engineers from Indians. And even in US, we like in, uh, uh, Indian doctors. Right. So the question comes whether the seed is bad or the soil is bad. I feel the soil is very bad here. We don't empower our students. We don't encourage our students. We keep on speaking. Whatever is spoken today, if it even 10% of it is implemented in this country, I think we'll have a revolution in this country. Understood. No, absolutely, Professor Shetty. Thank you so much for your thoughts. Uh, Professor Shridhar, if I may come back, I know that you know we, we have two topics. So, But with paucity of time, if I may request everyone to restrict their comments to one, one and a half minute. Uh, so for Obviously, the companies participating in this event, I think digital transformation, what is really needed? Where are you focusing from your university perspective? So if you have to pinpoint, Saurabh, I am looking at digital transformation in this area. Is it LMS? Is it automation of attendance? So in your current system, what would be digital transformation? And we, we agreed, I think all the panel agrees that you know both are important, so I'm not getting to the or question. It is important, but please help us understand from and then obviously you know professor barucha and then others please um, one one and a half minute on what where are you, what is digital transformation at your university where are you focusing currently uh, thank you very much i think uh, all of us agree that uh, covid uh, pandemic actually gave a very good uh, lesson for all of us i would like to mention that i am also proud to mention that uh, hindustan institute of technology and science is uh, one of such uh, universities which started uh, the online classes the day the lockdown was announced in the state government few other uh, universities were also ready for it. This actually became you know, possible because my predecessors you know, had a very good vision that we should actually move towards digital education. And even when offline education was there, they started you know, LMS, they started many other things, etc. And today, without that, I think it is very becoming difficult to reach everyone. And even today, some of our courses are running on hybrid mode. A few students who are actually far away from the uh, station uh, people you know from Kashmir and Far East, etc., Far South also, they are all coming on hybrid mode and then they are doing it. Earlier, there was also a mention that all PhD students should be in the campus, etc. Now it is not so. Wherever they can be, they will be there and then they can come through. Of course, there is always a limitation for the digital, uh, you know, the delivery. The personal li limitation is a few of our teachers are very good in personal contact and their contact, uh, you know, eye, eye, eye contacts as well as their body gestures makes a lot of difference. And maybe that is a little difficult actually to showcase through the digital, uh, you know, the mode of online thing, etc. And lastly, I would like to mention, there was one cartoon which I read earlier. This cartoon was telling that earlier the teachers were used to say to the students, please don't talk, shut your mouth. Now because online, everybody will say, please talk, somebody should answer me. Please tell me who is there on the other side. 
So this is what is the cycle. Thank you very much no, no, for but, giving but me sir, the opportunity. But uh, sir, you know, if you can help us answer, where, where as a university you are focusing from, if you have 100 rupees today, where, where are you investing those 100 rupees from digital transformation? Is it your LMS? Is it some other automation? It is basically on ERP and LMS. ERP and LMS, Both. great. Uh, Professor Barucha, if I ask you the same question, if you had $100 or any currency, where will you invest from a digital transformation perspective? Thank please? you. We are very interested in, of course, technologies that don't exist yet, but um, they will come. We are interested in, in seeing what happens and then quickly adopt the digital technologies that promote interactivity. There's, a, there's an uh, unfortunate term when people in the digital education world, they talk about delivering education. But from a cognitive science point of view, you cannot deliver education. You can deliver information. But an education is a necessarily interactive. If the student doesn't speak, doesn't write, doesn't solve problems, doesn't do experiments. The student is not being educated. What they, how they do on the exam, all of that is forgotten. We can demonstrate that. It, it's wasted effort. So digital technologies are still in their primitive phase. Uh, I'm very hopeful that they'll start becoming more like real life so that the problem you talked about is less of a problem. And uh, the platforms should be organized to promote interaction, collaboration, that kind of thing, rather than just uh, one-way delivery. Great, thank you so much. Um, and just a reminder to the panel that you know we are the line of you know last line between our participants and lunch, so we need to wrap up. So, uh, yeah, we got the time over seat as well. Uh, so quickly. Uh, you know, a yeah. 15 second answer. Yeah. Uh, I, I, where are I, you currently I, spending in digital? You rightly told that there is no controversy about uh, uh, digital transformation being required for universities. So we agree on that. At Sri Ramachandra, we have got an indigenously developed uh, learning management system. So quite a lot of uh, innovation can be done uh, through our own um, EDP specialists or the IT specialists. But a lot of input needs to happen through academicians. That is a very important point that we have to take into account. Uh, uh, we do invest in terms of getting help for certain modules, particularly the administrative modules when you require for a uh, student's module or something like that. We do have some connections with this thing. But uh, one size all fit that is being proposed by some of the companies, I do not know whether it will be really working for so what I wanted to stress one more thing on health profession education, which we have to remember is cognitive domain, it's easily to transfer information through online mechanisms, through digital technology. But when it comes to health professional education where experiential learning is involved, quite a lot of innovations have happened, virtual reality, augmented reality, so many things have come forward and lots of improvements have happened, but they are extraordinarily costly as well. And um, uh, we need to sort of look at how these things can provide simulated environment. At the end of the day, the student, the medical student, actually interacting with the patient. Nothing else is really able to give the exact feel. And lastly, the feel element. See, how much the patient who comes to the doctor, obviously he cannot be happy completely dealing with it from a distance. He would like him to feel, he would like him to examine, and then give out a... So that, so far, the technology has not really been... They are, they are attempting it. I know that there is a lot of attempt made and even some robotic surgeries are being performed from a distance. All these things are happening. But I think that becoming the regular order of the day, I think it's going to take another 50 years. Sure. But that is how we are going forward. I am extremely thankful for the opportunity there. So Professor Ooh. Shetty and Professor Yeah, Manjana, what I feel is I, I strongly feel that my students are not deprived of any technology. With this mobile in the hand in each and every student, even a first hand student, he is upbeat with it, entire technology, number one. But if at all possible, I would like to say I need we need to empower our student. We need to respect the talent in each and every student in this country. That is the most important where I might put my money for. Yeah, certainly agree with all the panelists that technology-driven education is the future. There is no doubt about it. At the same time, uh, 
we always feel that uh, anything in excess will have an issue. Okay, so education in particular, in my view, and our university believes very strongly that this should assist a teacher. This should not actually replace a classroom. Though there are so many uh, companies who are offering online classrooms, etc., you should actually bring in a concept of using that uh, feel component, what uh, Professor Vijayaragavan has mentioned, that is very important. And the last, other Im another important thing, there is no question about e using ERP, uh, ICT-enabled uh, systems and evaluation, etc., and also using blockchain for uh, information, data, uh, data safety, etc. We are all in for that. And we have, we have already invested uh, lots of money into it. The additional 100 rupees what you asked, that we will certainly invest because we come from a discipline of yoga. Lots to uh, take from technology and particularly digital transformation. Number one, manuscripts. Today, I don't have those ancient manuscripts available. At least if today, wherever it is available, it's available in London, it's available elsewhere. If those manuscripts can be digitized and made available to the libraries, number one, great contribution. Number two, simulations, as uh, uh, Professor mentioned, he is certainly needed. And also, we use lots of pose estimation, pose correction, and technology for lots of things in our education system. So digital transformation is certainly needed. And we are looking forward and we are investing uh, decently into all of these. And we agree that blended education is what the future, what we all look for. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, all the panelists. Thank you, gentlemen. Participants, thank you so much for your patience. I know that, you know, we were probably the last between you and lunch. So, um, and obviously organizers, thank you so much for allowing us those extra few minutes. Over to you, please. Thank you. Hello. Thank you so much to all our eminent speakers. Uh, I would like to request uh, Saurabh Bajad, sir, to please uh, provide token of appreciation for all our eminent speakers. Starting with, we have Dr. N.K. Manjunath. Next, we have Dr. S.N. Sridhara. Next, we have Dr. Balakrishna P. Shetty. Next eminent speaker, we have Professor Jamshed Barucha. Next, we have Dr. P. V. Vijayaraghavan. And also, I would like to request Professor Jamshed Barucha to please provide token of appreciation to Saurabh Bazaar.